Assalamu alaikum students. Welcome to the lecture number 16. Let's see what today we are going to cover. We'll start with the previous lecture. In the last lecture, we discussed what we had done. We had talked about feasibility analysis. We will test the litmus test. If we have an idea, we have a creative, innovative innovation, we have a creative idea. So, before we have to roll out all together in the market, that may not be a very smart way to do the things. اس کے لئے شاید بہتر یہ ہوگا کہ پہلے ہم لوگ اپنے طور پر یہ چیز میپ آؤٹ کرنے کی کوشش کریں کہ کیا اس پروڈکٹ کا پوٹینشل ہے کیا اس پروڈکٹ کے لئے انڈسٹری کے اندر جگہ ہے کیا جو مارکٹ ہے یہ اس کے لئے ایکسپٹیبل ہے پھر ہم لوگوں نے ایک اور ڈیمنشن کی بات کی تھی فیزیبیلیٹی انالیسز کے اندر کہ ہم لوگوں کو یہ بھی دیکھنا ہے کہ جو کسٹمر ہے کیا وہ ویلنگ ہے اس پروڈکٹ کو یا نئی نئی انویڈیو پروڈٹ کو خریدنے کے لیے جو کریٹیو چیزیں آپ نے انکلکیٹ کی ہیں جو نئے فیچرز ڈالے ہیں کیا کسٹمر اس کو پسند کر رہا ہے کیا وہ اس کے خریدنے کے لیے تیار ہیں اور اس کے ساتھ ساتھ کیا وہ ایک اچھی قیمت بھی دینے کے لیے تیار ہے کہ نہیں اس پروڈٹ یا سیویس کی جس کو انٹرپنور مارکٹ میں انٹروڈیوز کروا رہے ہیں فیزیبیلیٹی کے اندر ہم لوگوں نے ایک اور ایسپیکٹ بھی دیکھا تھا جس میں ہم لوگوں نے یہ فیگر آؤٹ کرنے کی کوشش کی تھی کہ فننشلی جو ہمارا بزنس ہے جو ہم لوگ سوچ رہے ہیں کیا وہ وائیبل ہے کی نہیں کیا ہمارے جو ریوینیوز کی سٹریم ہے وہ اتنی سٹرونگ ہے کہ جو ہمارے ایکسپیکٹڈ ایکسپینسز ہیں وہ مینفیکٹرنگ کے اندر بھی ہیں آپ کی سالریز ہے آپ کی ڈسٹریبیوشن ہے آپ کی مارکٹنگ کی ایکسپینس ہے پروموشن کی ایکسپینس ہے آپ لوگ رینٹ آؤٹ چیزیں کرنی ہوتی ہیں فیسیلیٹیز رینٹ کرنی ہوتی ہیں گاڑیوں کی ضرورت پڑتی ہے ٹرانسپورٹ کی ضرورت پڑتی ہے اگر آپ نے بوروئنگ کی ہے آپ نے انٹرسٹ کی پیمنٹس کرنی ہے اگر آپ نے کسی کے اجزات مل کے کام شروع کیا ہے تو اس صورت کے اندر آپ کو جو آپ کی اگری ٹرمز ہیں اس کے مطابق شیئرز بھی آپ کو پروفٹ کا شیئر بھی آپ کو ایکسچینج کرنا ہے بلکہ جس کا جتنا بنتا ہے وہ ڈیوائیڈ کر کے شیئر کرنا ہے ایک دوسرے کے ساتھ تو یہ بھی دیکھنا ضروری تھا فیزیبلیٹی انیلسز میں ہم لوگوں نے دیکھا تھا کہ کیا فننشلی ہمارا آئیڈیا وائیبل ہے یا نہیں اس کے علاوہ پھر ہم لوگوں نے یہ بات کی تھی فیزیبلیٹی انیلسز کو ہم لوگ فیزیبلیٹی انیلسز کی کہ ہم لوگ لٹمس ٹیسٹ کریں گے کہ اگر ہمیں نظر آیا کہ تب ہم اس کے لیے آگے فارملی پروسیڈ کریں گے اور ہم لوگوں نے یہ بھی ڈسکس کیا تھا کہ بزنس پلان is not the first step towards making a business viable اس کے لیے پہلے یہ اپنے طور پر انڈسٹینڈ کرنا اور یہ فگر آؤٹ کرنا کہ کیا انڈسٹری مارکٹ کسٹمر اور فنینشل جو کنسیڈریشنز ہیں اس کے اوپر یہ ہمارا جو پروڈکٹ ہے یہ جو ہمارا بزنس ہے وہ ٹھیک طرح سے چل پائے گا کہ نہیں once you see کہ آپ کا یہ بزنس وائیبل ہے with feasibility analysis پھر ہم لوگ next step کی طرف بڑھتے ہیں جو کہ بزنس پلان بنانے کا تھا اور اس کے بارے میں ہم لوگوں نے بات کی تھی کہ یہ بیسیکلی ایک written document ہے جس کے جس میں آپ کا بیسیکلی this is a blueprint of that business اس کے اندر آپ almost جتنے بھی aspects ہو سکتے ہیں operational level کے اوپر business کے with regards to various departments آپ ان کو integrate کرنے کی کوشش کرتے ہیں ہم لوگوں نے یہ دیکھا تھا کہ business plan basically اس کے بنیادی طور پر ذہن میں یہ آتا ہے کہ جی شاید اس لیے بناتے ہیں کہ اگر کسی investor کو ہم لوگوں نے attempt کرنا ہے یا ہم لوگوں نے کسی بینک سے borrowing کرنی ہے تو اس کی documentational requirement کے لیے ہم لوگ business plan بناتے ہیں حالانکہ اس کی جو نویت ہے وہ تھوڑی مختلف ہے business plan کی ضرورت اس لیے بھی پڑتی ہے کیونکہ entrepreneur کی possibility یہ ہے کہ جب وہ چیزوں کو map out کر رہا ہے لیکن اگر وہ individual scope کے اندر finances کو دیکھ رہا ہے individual scope میں marketing کو دیکھ رہا ہے individual scope کے اندر strategy کو دیکھ رہا ہے انڈویجل سکوپ کے اندر وہ مینوفیکٹرنگ کو دیکھ رہے ہیں تو ممکن ہے کہ ان کی آپس میں جو انفرمیشن کی کوہین ہے جو سٹریٹیجی کی کوہین ہے امنگ ڈیفرنٹ ڈپارٹمنٹس وہ پوسیبل نہ ہو تو اس کے لیے پھر ہمیں یہ ریٹن ڈاکیومنٹ کے اندر ہم لوگ یہ ایکسائز کرتے ہیں تاکہ جب ہم چیزوں کو رائٹ ڈاؤن کرتے ہیں پھر ہم لوگ فگر آؤٹ کرتے ہیں اور یہ انشور کروانے کوشش کرتے ہیں کہ یہ تمام کی تمام 
जो डिपार्टमेंट्स हैं इनके जो भी हम लोग स्ट्रेटजीज बना रहे हैं जो भी हम लोग ले आउट बना रहे हैं अपने बिजनेस को करने का वो आपस में वेल इंटीग्रेटेड हो मैंने आपको इसकी मिसाल दी थी कि अगर हम लोग पर्सनल सेलिंग की एग्जाम्पल दे रहे हैं कि जी हम लोग इस अप्रोच को यूज करेंगे सेल्स टेक्टिक को यूज करेंगे तो इट मे साउंड इन वेरी गुड इन अजनेस प्लान विद रिगार्ड टू दैट पर्टिकुलर प्रोडक्ट और इंडस्ट्री लेकिन अगर उसकी कॉस्टिंग रिफ्लेक्ट नहीं हुई हुई फाइनेंशियल प्लान में अगर उसके ह्यूमन रिसोर्सेज की जो रिक्वायरमेंट है पर्सनल सेलिंग के लिए वो रिफ्लेक्ट नहीं हुए हुए हमारे एच और प्लान के अंदर तो वो शायद बहुत ज्यादा फ्लॉड प्लान होगा तो जब हम लोग बेसिकली बिजनेस प्लान बनाते हैं बुनियादी मकसद उसका ये होता है कि हम लोग चीजों को इस तरह मैनेज करें इस तरह ले आउट करें कि वो आपस के अंदर एक ही डायरेक्शन के अंदर एक्टिविटी है उसी ने दूसरे को कॉम्प्लीमेंट करती हुई नजर आए उसमें फिर हम लोगों ने एलिमेंट्स ऑफ बिजनेस प्लान को भी डिस्कस किया था जिसमें हम लोगों ने बात की थी कि जिसके अंदर आपका कवर पेज होना चाहिए देन यू यू शुड डिटेल कि जिसकी स्ट्रेटजी किस तरह कर रहे हैं हम लोग क्या हमारी हम लो कॉस्ट प्रोवाइडर बनना चाह रहे हैं या डिफ्रेंसिएशन स्ट्रेटजी कर रहे हैं हम लोग देन वी ऑल्सो टॉक अबाउट कि जी मार्केटिंग प्लान किस तरह होगा आपका ऑपरेशनल प्लान किस तरह होगा क्या क्या एस्पेक्ट्स जो से उसमें हम लोगों ने कवर करे हैं और उसके अलावा हम लोगों ने बात की थी फाइनेंशियल प्लान की भी कि फाइनेंस के रिगार्डिंग हमें फंडिंग की कितनी जरूरत पड़ेगी उसके साथ साथ हमारी जो प्रोजेक्टेड स्टेटमेंट्स हैं उसके साथ भी उनको भी हमें इंटीग्रेट करना है ताकि जिस बंदे को भी हम लोग वो प्लान प्रेजेंट करें तो वो उस डॉक्यूमेंट को देख के उसको एक फुल फ्लेज आइडिया हो कि ये दिस डॉक्यूमेंट कंटेन्स ऑल द नेसेसरी डिटेल्स दैट आई नीड टू मेक डिसीजन ऑफ लैंडिंग टू दिस एंटरप्रनोर दैट आई नीड टू मेक एन इन्वेस्टमेंट विद दिस एंटरप्रनोर उसके अंदर हम लोगों ने एक इम्पोर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट जो कवर किया था वो एग्जेक्टिव समरी का था और उसमें हम लोगों ने ये फिगर आउट करने की कोशिश की थी कि उसमें बेसिकली आप जितने भी आपके एस्पेक्ट्स हैं एलिमेंट्स हैं बिजनेस प्लान के उनकी बड़ी स्लीक और पिन पॉइंटेड क्रिस्पी डिटेल के साथ आप उनको समराइज करने की कोशिश करते हैं कि वो एक डेढ़ दो सफे के अंदर जो आपकी एग्जेक्टिव समरी है उसको पढ़ के जो भी रीडर है उसको आपकी मार्केट का भी आइडिया हो जाए गैप का भी आइडिया हो जाए आप किस तरह उस गैप को कवर कर रहे हैं आपकी प्रोडक्ट्स की यूनिकनेस क्या है आपकी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन की यूनिकनेस क्या है आपकी मैनेजमेंट टीम की यूनिकनेस क्या है आप किन किन स्ट्रेटजीज को यूटिलाइज करते हुए अपने ऑब्जेक्टिव को अचीव करेंगे ये तमाम की तमाम चीजें वो आपको एक डेढ़ पेज की एग्जेक्टिव समरी के अंदर मिलनी चाहिए उसके अलावा हम लोगों ने उसके फॉर्मेट को भी डिस्कस किया था और बिजनेस प्लान प्रेजेंटेशन के कंक्लूडिंग रिमार्क्स भी देखे थे स्टूडेंट्स आज के लेक्चर में विल बी फोकसिंग ऑन सोशल एंटरप्रेन्योर्स विल ट्राई टू आइडेंटिफाई द की एट्रीब्यूट्स ऑफ सोशल एंटरप्राइजेस द करेक्टरिस्टिक्स ऑफ सोशल एंटरप्राइजेस एंड विल आल्सो ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड हाउ सोशल एंटरप्राइजेस डिफर फ्रॉम द ट्रेडिशनल और अदर ऑर्गेनाइजेशन आज के लेक्चर के एंड पे हम लोग एक वीडियो देखेंगे गूगल बॉयज के ऊपर और उसके अंदर जो दो उसके फाउंडर्स थे उनकी लाइफ के ऊपर स्टोरी है कि उन्होंने किस तरह मुलाकात हुई उनकी क्या उनकी टेक्निकल एक्सपर्टीज के ऊपर उन्होंने प्रोजेक्ट किया उनकी बुनियाद पे प्रोजेक्ट किया जो कि ट्रांसफॉर्म हुआ इन गूगल एंड विच हेज बिकम अ ग्लोबल फिनोमिन उनके सक्सेस के क्या डायनामिक्स थे और उसके साथ साथ वो अब आगे किस तरह ग्रो कर रहे हैं and where do these entrepreneurs start to, uh, uh, sorry stand today is cheez ke upar bhi hum log nigha dodayenge so uh, let's get started by understanding what a social enterprise is according to social enterprise uh, coalition social enterprises are the businesses trading for social and environmental purpose so first thing that needs to be understood is That they are actually businesses. The traditional businesses हैं उनका जो focus है वो profit making पे होता है याद है आप लोगों जब entrepreneur को define किया था उसमें भी हम लोग बात कर रहे थे कि जी एंटरप्रनोर इज एन इंडिविजुअल जो कि वो वुड असेंबल नेसेसरी रिसोर्सेज ही विल ट्राई टू फिल अ मार्केट गैप बाय ऑफरिंग यूनिक प्रोडक्ट्स और सर्विसेज दैट मीट द कस्टमर एक्सपेक्टेशन and why would he do that 
बिकॉज ही वॉन्ट्स टू मेक प्रॉफिट तो इसके अंदर भी वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट बिजनेसेस बट द बिजनेसेस आर एक्चुअली ट्रेडिंग फॉर सोशल एंड एनवायरमेंटल पर्पज सो जो फोकस है वो फाइनेंशियल से थोड़ा सा अलग है फाइनेंशियल गेन्स तो गेन करने ही है लेकिन एक्चुअली ये बिजनेसेस फोकस करते हैं किसी सोशल इशू के ऊपर किसी एनवायरमेंटल इशू के ऊपर और उस इशू को केटर करने के लिए सपोर्ट फ्रॉम करते हैं एक चीज हम लोगों को जो अंडरस्टैंड करने की जरूरत है कि एक तो हम लोग हमारी जो ट्रेडिशनल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन है वो थोड़ी कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट करती है फिलोथ्रोपिक साइड के ऊपर या एनवायरमेंटल के प्रोडक्ट के ऊपर तो दे डू नॉट कंस्टिट्यूट एज सोशल एंटरप्राइज सोशल एंटरप्राइज आपकी वो एंटरप्राइज है या वो बिजनेस है जो कि फॉर्म ही प्राइमेरिली उस इशू को केटर करने के लिए हुआ है और उसको सपोर्ट करने के लिए एक ऐसा बिजनेस मॉडल डेवलप किया जाता है जो कि प्रॉफिट कमाता है एंड दैट गेट्स री इन्वेस्टेड अगेन एंड अगेन इन ऑर्डर टू कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट टूवर्ड्स द कॉज ऑफ केटरिंग दैट सोशल इशू और द एनवायरमेंटल इशू इसके साथ साथ सोशल एंटरप्राइजेस आर डिस्टिंगटिव बिकॉज देर सोशल एंड एनवायरमेंटल पर्पज इज एब्सोल्यूटली सेंट्रल टू वर्ट दे डू फॉर एन एंटरप्रनोर वट इज सेंट्रल देर प्रॉफिट ओरिएंटेशन दैट इज द प्राइम ऑब्जेक्टिव देर बट इन केस ऑफ सोशल एंटरप्राइज इट्स द सोशल और द एनवायरमेंटल concern that is of the pivotal value their profits are reinvested to sustain and further their mission of positive change ab jo profit orientation hai that is not going into the pockets that is getting a reinvested in the same business that would help that business expand itself further make more profits और अल्टीमेटली ये कॉम्प्लीमेंट करेगा उस कॉज को एनवायरमेंटल या सोशल जिसके ऊपर ये बिजनेस फोकस कर रहे हैं एक और प्रस्पेक्टिव uh, uh, देखते हैं मोहम्मद यूनिस डॉक्टर मोहम्मद यूनिस का हु वाज़ द फाउंडर ऑफ ग्रामीण बैंक बांग्लादेश वन ऑफ द वेरी इमिनेंट सॉरी एमिनेंट सोशल एंटरप्राइज ऑफ द वर्ल्ड अकॉर्डिंग टू हिम वी हैव डिस्क्राइब and keep on describing organizations motivated motivated by social objectives as non profit organization we need to have another description that is non loss organization because we don't want to lose money and our objective is to address a particular problem so we are a non loss business with social objective नॉन प्रॉफिट ऑर्गेनाइजेशन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन की टर्म तो आपने पहले भी सुनी होगी कि जी दिस बिजनेसेस आर नॉट फॉर प्रॉफिट वी आर नाउ टॉकिंग अबाउट नॉन लॉस बिजनेसेस वेयर बाय द फोकस इज ऑन डूइंग बिजनेस इन सच अ वे दैट वी डू नॉट इनकर एनी लॉसेस रादर वी आर मेकिंग प्रॉफिट्स एंड दोस प्रॉफिट्स आर गेटिंग रीइन्वेस्टेड इन द सोशल एंड एनवायरमेंटल कॉज अगर एग्जाम्पल ने सोशल एंटरप्राइज की तो द सोशल एंटरप्राइज मूवमेंट फर्स्ट इमर्ज इन एटीन फोर्टीज रॉशडेल इट्स टाउन ऑफ द यूनाइटेड किंगडम मैनचेस्टर के करीब ही है अ वर्कर्स कोऑपरेटिव वॉज सेट अप टू प्रोवाइड हाई क्वालिटी अफोर्डेबल फूड इन रिस्पॉन्स टू फैक्ट्री कंडीशन दैट वर कंसिडर्ड टू बी एक्सप्लोइटेटिव जो फैक्ट्री की जो कंडीशंस थी दे वर टेरेबल पीपल वर नॉट हैप्पी देयर और उन चीजों को केटर करने के लिए जो इश्यूज उनको फूड की क्वालिटी की और महंगाई से बचाने के लिए कॉपरेटिव बनाया गया था जिसका जो बुनियादी मकसद था वो प्रॉफिट तो कमाता था लेकिन इट वुड ऑफर द गुड्स टू द वर्कर्स एट अ रीजनेबल प्राइस जिससे वो उनकी जो अफोर्डेबिलिटी है वो बढ़ जाती थी सो नाउ लेट्स क्विक लुक ऑन द प्रोसेस ऑफ सोशल एंटरप्रनोरशिप the first thing is finding an opportunity every individual again just like enter her individual different hota hai uske aspirations different hote hain isi tarah jo entrepreneurs hain social entrepreneurs hain har bande ka ek apna interest hota hai some people may be focusing on alleviating poverty some people may be focusing on 
uh, women empowerment depending upon one what one circumstances have been through kis kis situation se guzar kya hai har bande ka apna interest hai to pehle number pe ye figure out karna hai social entrepreneur ko ki wo kis area ke andar kis opportunity ko utilize karna cha rahe uske baad develop a business concept aur ye bilkul usi tarah se hoga jis tarah ki entrepreneurial jo hamara business conception hai creativity is going to be very critical innovation you say that is going to be an integral part of uh, this phenomenon and then he the social entrepreneur needs to figure out what success means and how to measure it now this is very very important entrepreneur ke case mein yani plain entrepreneur ke case mein jo majority hum log ek yardstick lenge uski uh, achievement ka wo uski profitability hogi jabki social entrepreneur ke दो एवेन्यूज हैं जिस पे उसने रन करना है एक उसकी प्रॉफिटेबिलिटी है और उसके साथ साथ जो सोशल चेंज या जो इन्वायरमेंटल इशू जिसको वो टारगेट कर रहा है उसके अंदर वो कितनी बेहतरी लाया है दैट इज गोइंग टू बी अ मैयर अपार्ट फ्रॉम द प्रॉफिटेबिलिटी तो जो सोशल एंटरप्रनोर है उसको दो एवेन्यूज के ऊपर दो डिफरेंट डायरेक्शन के ऊपर अपने गोल्स अचीव करने होते हैं तो ये फिगर आउट करना कि जी इम्पोर्टेंट क्या है और सक्सेस को डिफाइन किस तरह करना है और उसको मैयर किस तरह करना है उसको उसका जो जो वेरिएबल है किस किस को आप मैयर करके अपने आप को ये इस्टेब्लिश करेंगे कि आप सक्सेसफुल हुए हैं या नहीं हुए एक्वायर द राइट रिसोर्स दैट मे इंक्लूड फिजिकल रिसोर्स फिजिकल एसेट्स इट मे इंक्लूड इंटलेक्चुअल रिसोर्स इट मे इंक्लूड ह्यूमन रिसोर्स और इनकी इंटीग्रेशन भी ऑल टूगेदर हो सकती है लॉन्च द एंटरप्राइज एंड ग्रो इट एंड अल्टीमेटली अटेन योर गोल्स लेट्स हैव अ गुड लुक ऑन द करेक्टरिस्टिक्स ऑफ सोशल एंटरप्राइज दे ऑपरेट एज कमर्शली रन बिजनेसिस ऐसा नहीं है कि ये चीजों को डिस्काउंट करके सिर्फ एक बिजनेस रन कर रहे होते हैं इनकी भी ओरिएंटेशन जो ये टूवर्ड्स प्रॉफिटेबिलिटी उसी तरह की होती है लेकिन इसके साथ साथ इनके सोशल गोल्स भी होते हैं जिनको ये एक्वायर करने की अचीव करने की कोशिश करते हैं दे डू एम टू मेक प्रॉफिट लेट मी गिव यू एग्जाम्पल ऑफ ग्रामीण बैंक इसका जिक्र आपने एवरी नाउ एंड देन सुना भी होगा डॉक्टर यूनिस जिनकी भी मैंने डेफिनेशन भी आपको कोट की है Uh, he's a, a noble laureate aur inhone ye micro financing ka concept bangladesh mein start kiya tha whereby he started uh, giving small loans to females jo ke uh, us chote se loan se apna business start karti thi aur usko uh, pay back kar deti thi aur ultimately it has, it became a phenomenon there whereby now most of the borrowers of gramin bank which itself is a very profitable organization are the females and i was uh, watching a documentary the other day which was revealing ke jo uh, default rate hai uh, of the <coughs> customers that is much much lesser than the conventional uh, banks uske sath sath jo empowerment hai of the females wo wala aspect bhi gramin focus kar rahe उसके साथ जो पॉवर्टी एलिविएशन है कि गुर्बत को कम करने की बात तो अदरवाइज इट्स डिफिकल्ट लेकिन ये चैनलाइज कर रहा है रिसोर्सेस को टुवर्ड्स द पुअर इन सच अ वे दैट दे कैन यूटिलाइज इट फॉर देयर ओन बैटरमेंट फॉर देयर ओन इकोनॉमिक इंडिपेंडेंस टू ब्रिंग दम आउट ऑफ द विशेष सर्कल ऑफ पॉवर्टी उसके साथ साथ generate the bulk of their income through sales of good or services they use good businesses business practices and principles since they are standing for a good cause since they are uh, striving to achieve a certain social or environmental target for them it's very important to reflect ethic in every manner possible so social enterprises are usually the ones जो के हाईएस्ट एथिकल स्टैंडर्ड्स को मेंटेन करने की कोशिश करती हैं। उसके साथ साथ दे यूज मेजॉरिटी ऑफ देयर प्रॉफिट्स टू फर्दर सोशल और एनवायरमेंटल गोल्स 
and <coughs> they may hold the social enterprise mark. Now let us have a quick look on the key differences between the traditional enterprises and the social enterprises. Uh, explicit aims, triple bottom line, the private sector business primarily focuses on trading, social enterprises, enterprises too have a commercial focus but will also have an explicit social and or environmental purpose. Moving on to funding, the financing hai in dono, uh, different entities ki uske andar bhi nature mein kaafi difference hai. Uh, traditional means jo aapko uh, nazar aayenge uh, entrepreneur ke case mein we'll be talking about uh, one saving or from friends and family business angels uske nisbat jo uh, financing mix social enterprises ka that is quite interesting isme ek taraf aapki sales income aayegi uske sath sath agar aap koi commercial contracts kar rahe hain usse bhi aapki proceeds expected hoti hain service level agreements hain aur uske sath sath agar aapko grant supports bhi mil sakti hain agar koi funding agency hai jo ki usi uh, issue ke upar funding dene ke liye taiyar hai to they can contribute in uh, in their fundings of the social enterprise uske sath sath risk the social enterprise are usually governed by a board of volunteers which may mean that they are more risk averse in terms of pursuing business ventures since it's uh, it's not an entrepreneurial setup whereby one person is in charge and he's taking risk the uh, social enterprises and the structure is usually ek, volunteers ka board of governors hota hai jo ke mil ke decision leta hai about that particular business so uh, when it comes to a mix so on 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 whole or in totality it may be safely said ke inka jo focus hai wo that is how how risk aversive uske saath saath jo scale hai iska the startup cost may be much higher because social enterprise usually have to operate on scale that is large enough to sustain its social commitment from the beginning chote level pe moment ye start nahi hoti aapko kisi bade level pe start karna padta hai taaki inki sustainability easily ensure ho sake coming to the investment side social enterprise may have difficulty gaining in access to traditional form of investment such as loan financing agar business run kar raha ho traditionally to uske liye funding nisbatan aasan hoti hai uh, leaders of social enterprises are usually driven by the social potential of the venture and will need to find support for the other areas of enterprise as well stakeholders social enterprises ke case ke andar bahut zyada complex honge uh, they usually have a wider range of stakeholders involved in their development which can mean that there is a wide influence on development process और स्टेक होल्डर्स का हम आगे जाके देखेंगे एक पूरा हमारा लेक्चर जो है स्टेक होल्डर एनालिसिस पे है उसमें आपको इस चीज को फर्दर अंडरस्टैंड करने का मौका मिलेगा स्वेट इक्विटी इज इन्वेस्टेड टू ग्रो एंड बिल्ड द एंटरप्राइज बट द पर्पस इज नॉट फाइनेंशियल गेन बट द सोशल गेन देर सर्टन मिथ्स अबाउट सोशल एंटरप्राइजेज इज वेल विच इज सोशल एंटरप्रनोर आर एंटर बिजनेस दैट इज एक्चुअली नॉट द केस they are commercial organization but they have got a relatively different focus the difference between commercial and social entrepreneurship is greed not true it's just that agar hum log bill gates ki video dekhe ya bill gates ki life ko dekhe aap to he made a lot of money uh, he, he became the richest person of the world now he is spending a lot of money in the philanthropic uh, it uh, in the in the philanthropic side of the society social entrepreneurs are non profit managers social entrepreneurs are born not made that is not the true they are made social en entrepreneurs are basically misfits for the organization actually social entrepreneurs are the individuals jo ke jo aapke traditional entrepreneurial attributes hain wo bhi hote hain aur uske sath sath unki social strength jo uh, side hai wo bhi strong hoti hai way by they try to curb the evils of the society and they do not focus solely on their own development rather they think about society as a whole social enterprises enterprises usually fail that is not the truth and social entrepreneurs love risk abhi hum log kuch der pehle zikr kar chuke hain usually they are risk aversive aaj ka lecture hamara again darmiyan mein hum log koshish karte hain ki ji routine ke jo hamare lectures hain unke sath hat ke hum log 
एंटरप्रनोरशिप इन एक्शन को भी देखेंगे जो रियल लाइफ एंटरप्रनोर है हाउ आर दे डूइंग और हाउ वेल दे हैव डन तो आज के केस में हम लोगों ने आज एक वीडियो देखनी है दैट इज ऑन द गूगल बॉयज उन एंटरप्रनोर का आज हम जिक्र करेंगे जिन्होंने गूगल फॉर्म की थी और ये एक ऐसी सर्विस है जिससे ऑलमोस्ट हर बंदा जिसके पास इंटरनेट एक्सेस है वो मुस्तफ़ीद हो रहा पर्टिकुलरली स्टूडेंट्स एज यू कैन सी द स्लाइड देवर टू बॉयज लैरी पेज हुज द चीज सी ई ओ एंड सी एम ओ एंड सर्जी ब्रेन हु इज द सी टी ओ और ये दोनों स्टूडेंट्स जो थे ये यूनिवर्सिटी के अंदर स्टैनफोर्ड के अंदर उनकी मुलाकात हुई और इनको अपने जो इंटरेस्ट थे वो कॉमन नजर आए और इन्होंने एक गैराज के अंदर अपनी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन को स्टार्ट किया एंड दिस इज द गैराज जहां से गूगल स्टार्ट हुई थी स्टूडेंट्स लेट्स मूव ऑन एंड सी द गूगल बॉयज I'm Darren Osborne for the Biography Channel. Google was the brainchild of two Stanford PhD dropouts, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Now before the two launched Google, internet searches usually turned up more garbage than gold, and wading through all the irrelevant results was time-consuming and frustrating. But Brin and Page streamlined the process and reinvented the way we gather information. Billionaires many times over, the two men still live very modestly. The inventors of Google are next. and Sergey are the quintessential Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. They're smart, they're visionary. Larry Page and Sergey Brin invented Google in the late 1990s when they were PhD students at Stanford. They think that basically they're doing something terrific and they're really out to change the world. Today, Google is the world's preeminent internet search engine. It clarified and cleared up the clutter of the internet and made it possible to find what you were looking for quickly and easily. It's hard to really predict what the impact of Google will be. It's one of those technologies that shifts the way people do things. In the old days, finding stuff on the internet was complicated, so you had to be a skilled researcher, but not today. Now, thanks to Google, the internet search company, Everybody with a computer and an internet hookup can search the web. It clarified and cleared up the clutter of the internet and made it possible to find what you were looking for quickly and easily. That was a major breakthrough. Google processes more than 200 million queries a day from all over the world. I'm from England and a lot of people in England use Google. Everybody in Ireland uses Google. Yeah, yes, Google is in France is very popular. One thing that's happened with Google becoming commonplace is people really expect to get information. So you're going out on a first date, you Google. You find out something about the guy or the girl before you go. The Google index becomes who you are in other people's eyes. Um, that's a new, new thing, and we as a culture are just getting used to it. Google has helped improve health care. And doctors will all tell you that their patients are far more informed when they come in than they ever have been. Google was the brainchild of two brainy Stanford University PhD dropouts, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Larry and Sergey are the quintessential Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. They're smart, they're visionary, uh, they're pig-headed in the best sense of the word. Page and Brin introduced Google in 1998. Their timing couldn't have been better. 
Google managed to hit it just at the time when tens of millions of people were coming to the web. Dot-com startups were on fire. Interest in the internet was soaring. The web was exploding with information. The only problem was finding it. The existing search engines did the job, but they often turned up more junk than gems. Before Google, often searching, you had to do it multiple times to be able to find what you're looking for. Or if you're browsing on a site like Yahoo, you had to click through a lot of pages. They all had uh, various problems. Some had irrelevant results. Um, you'd type in a query for cars and get uh, lawnmowers or tractors. Plowing through all the garbage to find the few nuggets of relevant results was time consuming and frustrating. To overcome the problem, search engines like Yahoo used human beings, librarians instead of computers, to catalog the web's information and create searchable directories. There's always been a basic uh, philosophical difference between things like Yahoo and things like Google. The Yahoo side, which is what falls more under traditional librarianship is that you have people who are experts who know what's going to be the best thing to look at and they can put together a catalog, an index, a directory that lets you go and find the things that they put there. But that solution wasn't perfect either. When you get millions and billions and will be coming to trillions of different things on the web, you can't have enough editors to do that, uh, but you can have computers, more and more computing power to go and check that out. Bryn and Page opted for computing power. After studying existing engines, they came up with a supercharged machine that became a model for all other search engines. Now what I would like to do is just to show you what one second... Sergey Bryn revealed some of its inner workings at a recent technology, entertainment, and design conference in Santa Monica. This is how we have to move the bits around to actually get the people the answers to their questions. You can see that um, there's a lot of data running around. Uh, it has to go all over the world through fibers, uh, through satellites, through all kinds of connections. Bryn and Page help direct traffic to sites big and small, to independent journalists, to businesses and organizations which might not otherwise have been found. I think they see the goal of something like Google to a large degree as making society more democratic. Google also helped pioneer a whole new field of marketing that matched advertisements to relevant search results. Users, when they're looking for something like flowers, will serve a flower ad, something that's targeted to their very specific query. Prior to Google, no one knew how to make money off of search engines, so no one paid much attention to perfecting them. Google has turned search into a money-making machine. Search-related advertising is now growing faster than all other forms of marketing. Google has become, on both the search and the adver advertising side, sort of the standard for how you both find things on the Internet and how you make money on the Internet. It's hard to really predict what the impact of Google will be. It's one of those technologies that shifts the way people do things. And the automobile didn't just get people from their farm to town. It shifted the whole culture, shifted the whole way that we organize cities and roads and everything else. The Internet is doing that. And Google is a big part of making the Internet work that way. Google's success has been closely watched by its rivals. In November 2004, the fiercest competitor of all, giant Microsoft, announced that it was launching its own search engine. Now everyone's gunning for Google, and the guys who made it happen, two PhD wannabes turned search engine billionaires. Google founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin didn't intend to start their own company. What they wanted to do was sell their invention to one of the existing search companies. AltaVista, Yahoo, you name it, Excite, they talk, InfoSeek, they talked to them all. And all said the same thing. Search is kind of over. We're not that interested in great search technologies. Our search is good enough. And any one of those companies could have had that technology during that period of time, 97, early 98, for a song. So they decided that they were going to form their own company and try to do it on their own. 
Bryn and Paige had known each other only three years at that point. Bryn, a 23-year-old doctoral student in computer sciences at Stanford, met Paige, 24, in 1995, when he showed the newly arrived PhD candidate around the campus. Sergey and Larry were in the same program. They, you know, had uh, similar research interests, but they were not friends. Um, and what I heard was when they met, they didn't really like each other. That doesn't surprise me at all, because super smart people generally are wary of other super smart people. Page was the son of a Michigan State University computer science professor. Larry was always a very independent kind of guy. He's not the kind of student who comes in and says, what are you working on? Tell me what to do. Uh, he'd come in and say, I've got this idea I want to pursue. He was a born inventor. In his earlier career, he did things like build a huge inkjet printer of his own out of Legos or a plotter. He comes up with things that don't sound like they would work, and then he figures out how to make them work. Sergey Brin was the son of a University of Maryland mathematics professor. Brin's family had emigrated to the U.S. from the Soviet Union when he was only six years old. Sergey always seemed very bright, of course, uh, and very sure of himself. His interests ranged well beyond search engines. Sergey is, is really looking into new ideas on biotech and space travel and those sorts of things. Very interested in the outdoors and sports and roller hockey and stuff like that. But of the two, probably the more outgoing. Despite their rocky start, Bryn and Paige soon discovered they had much in common and began collaborating. We weren't really sure we wanted to build a search engine. We sort of accidentally ended up building technology that could help search, and so then we built a search engine. Myself and my partner, Larry, uh, were just doing research in managing large amounts of information and what's called data mining, which means finding patterns in them. Eventually, we turned to the World Wide Web, which is basically most of human knowledge. What they found was a rapidly expanding universe of information and several flawed search engines. First of all, just their, their coverage. They couldn't cover everything. They could go out and get more and more pages, but the scale was exploding at a, at a speed faster than they could handle. And the time for response. That is, you went to one of those search engines and you discovered that it would take 10, 15 seconds. you get results back. Bryn and Page were convinced they could do better. They looked at the construction of web pages, at the clickable buttons which link one page to another. Then they looked at the billions of clickable links crisscrossing cyberspace. And they discovered a pattern. The more authoritative, more popular sites all had lots of incoming links. Ultimately, what we discovered is that you could take the patterns that you found in a, all of the world's knowledge and use that to create a better search engine. And that's exactly what they did. They wrote a search engine program which used the number of incoming links, along with lots of other variables, to identify which web pages were most relevant for each query. But finding computers to run the program was a problem. The machines that ran existing search engines were very expensive. So they had to figure out how to make do with what they had, which was a lot of personal computers, cheap stuff that was laying around. And they were able to go and put these things together. They took a bunch of computer hard drives and slaved them together. To save money, they built a cabinet out of children's Legos. After months of tweaking, they were finally ready to take their engine out for a trial run. We put up an initial very simple prototype at Stanford. It was, uh, it was actually originally the project was called Backrub. Pretty soon after that, the next generation we called Google. Google sent a bunch of cyber explorers called spiders or robots out onto the World Wide Web to forage for information. Each time they found a new web page, they copied it and sent it back to Bryn and Page's computers. By 1998, they had stored 25 million pages. At the time, search engines were not widely used, so some website owners were incensed at the intrusion. There was one guy who was an artist in Singapore, actually, who had a site. It was public. It was open on the web. Anybody could go and get things. It wasn't that it was being held private. But all of a sudden, he sees 
some computer at Stanford is downloading thousands of different pages from it. And we had to say to them, look, we're not saving the pages. We're not redistributing. All we're doing is indexing. All we're doing is making a list of what we find so that other people can find it. But he actually went so far as to talk to the legal office, say he was going to sue. Despite the contrarians, most people liked Brandon Page's souped-up engine. It not only gave relevant results, it was also a lot faster than the search engines using the expensive computers. Typically, if you have a very large machine, the processor is running very fast, but there are bottlenecks. It takes it time. You can only do one disk drive at a time or something. What they realize is if you can figure out a way to get a lot of small machines working together on the search problem, that you don't have the same bottlenecks. Brin and Page became obsessed with speed, doing everything they could to shave tenths and hundredths of a second off their search times. And they realized that if they could bring that time factor down to a second or less, that people would use search in a totally different way. So in their design of the computers and the servers, they kept that as a really primary goal. They had to get it down. They had to throw in enough extra computing, enough extra research memory, whatever it took, so they could get that answer back in a second. Everyone who tried Google liked it. The name was supposed to be Google, G-O-O-G-O-L, the mathematical term for one followed by 100 zeros. But? Well, it was before the Google spell checker <laughs> existed. <laughs> I'll say that. Soon, the number of queries on Google became more than Brin and Page's computers could handle. Encouraged by the reception Google got at Stanford, Brin and Page began looking for partners who wanted to license their technology. Larry has always been motivated, and Sergey too, really, by wanting to do something that's useful for the world. They both grew up in academic families. The making a lot of money wasn't what was important. It was learning, knowledge, teaching. And I think from the beginning, uh, there wasn't a drive of what's the most profitable thing to do. It was really what's the way that people can get the most information. But the world outside Stanford didn't share Brin and Page's idealism. They said, this is a great idea technologically. But from the business point of view at that time, the wisdom was search engines weren't where it was at. They were a technical thing. They were going to be part of the woodwork, part of the infrastructure. In other words, you couldn't make money off of them. The big internet money makers were all portals, sites with lots of services and advertising, like Yahoo and America Online. Unable to license their invention, the two young search engineers went looking for investors to start their own company. They found Andy Bechtelsheim, founder of Sun Computing. Andy whipped out his checkbook and on the hood of his car wrote a check to Larry and Sergey for $100,000 and said, well, what do I write it out? What do I make the check out to? Um, and they said, well, we're thinking of calling the project Google. So he wrote it out to Google and that forced them to incorporate. Putting their PhD plans on hold, Brynn and Page set up shop in a friend's home. We thought, well, they'll probably just be there during the day while we're at work and we won't notice. Um, but they were actually there 24 hours a day all the time. As Page and Brynn toiled, the number of queries rose to 10,000 a day, and the press began to take notice. Articles praising Google appeared in newspapers and magazines. PC Magazine named Google one of its top 100 websites. They ultimately secured $25 million in funding from uh, two of the biggest names in venture capital. Um, and when that happened, that's when the, 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 the greater world first got an inkling that this might be a, an important company. Funding in hand, still battling enormous odds, Brin and Page moved their fledgling company into spacious new quarters. Sergey and Larry are, are, have all the advantages of youth. They think that basically they're doing something terrific and they're really out to change the world, to use Steve Jobs' uh, phraseology. In 1999, one-year-old Google had 39 employees and was receiving 3 million queries a day. A year later, queries were up to 60 million a day. During that time, Brin and Page introduced advertising on their search pages and signed partnership deals extending Google's reach to Italy, the United Kingdom, Japan, and China. 
the company was clearly on a roll. To meet demand, Rin and Page hired hundreds of new employees, many PhDs, the best and the brightest. In addition to just uh, being bright, great at their job, uh, accomplished, uh, we want people who are going to fit the Google culture. And we have a very open, uh, free atmosphere here. People have lots of fun. Uh, they're excited about their work, and they work, work together a lot. Part think tank, part playground. Google's headquarters were a reflection of that culture. When we started Google, we started it to be the kind of place, basically, that we would like to hang out in, we being, you know, computer science grad students. And so, you know, we had all this free food. Here, you just walk in, you know, you grab some healthy food. You can sit and chat with your colleagues, uh, talk about all kinds of work projects, uh, learn about new things. It's a place where you can you know, meet over a game of pool and discuss some ideas there. And so we find that this kind of environment, you know, very, is very creative. Google's creative environment has given birth to all sorts of new ideas. A search engine for images, one for catalogs, for comparing prices on consumer products, for news groups, news reports, and much more. While adding all the new bells and whistles, Brin and Page increased the power of their search engine, sending it deeper and deeper into cyberspace. So how does Google work? Why is it so successful? Google's search for answers begins, as do many great journeys of discovery, with a robot explorer heading deep into the unknown. In Google's case, the unknown is cyberspace. The Explorer, a computer program Brin and Page call Googlebot. Googlebot crisscrosses cyberspace at warp speed. Its mission, to find every website, to copy every web page. So it goes and looks at each page and says, ah, I found a new website, gold mine. And it'll go over there and download those pages and find out if it links to anything that it hasn't seen before. And this way, it can span the whole world. Googlebot keeps track of how often each website changes its pages. With a large search engine like Google, there's always a problem of freshness because there's no way you can go and do three billion pages every day. So what they do is they have a complex set of priorities. So there's certain kinds of pages which they'll actually go to on a re regular basis. News companies, for example. Googlebot visits CBSNews.com in New York for example, continuously throughout the day. Each time it copies a page, it leaves an electronic calling card. On a sample day, Googlebot hit cbsnews.com servers more than 34,000 times. After copying a page, Googlebot sends it back to Google, where it's sorted and stored in the company's computerized index. When someone types a query, digital camera, for example, Google's search engine doesn't have to search the entire World Wide Web. It simply scans its own archives, looking for documents with those words on them. In this case, 16,800,000 documents. You have to remember that computers aren't very smart. And they can go and find all the pages with particular words on them, but you have no idea whether it's from somebody authoritative, New York Times, like Libya Britannica, or just somebody often just some written some email that happens to be out on the web. So how does Google figure out which of the 16 million documents are most important? The answer is PageRank, a top secret algorithm invented by Larry Page. PageRank is what separates Google from the competition. What Google guys did, and brilliantly so, is to use the link structure of the net as a popularity contest. Page realized that the most popular websites all had lots of links pointing to them, and that those links could be used as a measure of importance. Pages vote for one another by linking to them. When you put a link on your page to somebody else, you're saying that page is important, you're voting for it. So a web page that has 20,000 links to it would be more important than one that had six or none. And that was good enough for Page and Brin. 
Their computers couldn't make value judgments, but they could count votes and list web pages in order of importance. Page's ranking system is actually much more complicated. It looks at a lot of other stuff as well. What makes Google's search engine even more remarkable is how quickly it works. Google is obsessed with speed. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to see how long it takes between hitting carriage return and getting results back. The time to call up 16 million digital camera results and put them in the proper order? Just .59 seconds. Google's speed and accuracy made it the engine of choice for searchers worldwide. As the infant Google grew and changed, its logo marked the passing months. New Year's Eve hats gave way to fireworks, then pumpkins and turkeys. By 2001, the precocious three-year-old was answering 100 million queries a day. We have about 5 billion pages in our index, which is, uh, compared to when we launched, we had, I think, 20 million or something like that, so that's 200 times larger. We support 100 languages. As the company changed, so did the lives of its founders. I get to travel out on business, I get to meet people. Just about a month ago, I was uh, meeting Mikhail Gorbachev and some other dignitaries in the event in London. More importantly, Bryn and Page reversed course on a critical issue, advertising. In the beginning, they were dead set against it. They saw it as annoying and a violation of Google's corporate philosophy. One of our engineers came up with a very simple way of phrasing it, which is, don't be evil. But then, Bryn and Page discovered they could exorcise the evil by marrying search results with advertising. Their theory was, if you can tie the advertising to the keywords, then the ads that would come up when you put in a particular keyword would be relevant to what you're looking for, and maybe even helpful. They called their advertising AdWords. They were simple text ads that were clearly separated from the search results. Some search engines out there today sort of mix in paid results uh, with the regular results, and they don't label them. So, uh, so the user doesn't know that that would not have appeared had they not paid for it. And I, I think that's really wrong. AdWords is actually the product that really launched Google into the stratosphere in terms of companies and, and in terms of growth. You go to Google. You type in wildflower seeds. Up come a bunch of listings, little rectangular ads, little squares with type in them. Those are the sponsored listings or the pay-per-click ads, the ad words. The top listing is an ad for American Meadows, a Vermont-based company that sells seeds for all sorts of wildflowers. Google displays the ad every time someone types in the search term wildflower seeds. You click on this and you go immediately to our home page. Ray Allen is president of American Meadows. The really revolutionary thing about pay-per-click advertising like AdWords is you put your ad up there. The consumer really finds you. You don't have to go find him like you do in, an ad, in, a, in a magazine or on television. He finds you. When someone clicks on one of, their ad, one of your ads, they're saying, I want, to, I want to see your product. You're not having to hold up your ad and say, please look at my product nor do you have to pay thousands of dollars up front. Google auctions its search terms to advertisers on a per-click basis. Allen bid 62 cents for the term wildflower seeds. Every time someone clicks on his ad, he pays Google that amount. Allen's bid was the highest, so his ad appears first. One of the most important things about making AdWords work for you is to be in the top three on your most important terms. You've got to be. Computer tools allow advertisers to monitor on a real-time basis how their search terms are doing. One of our best terms is always wildflower seeds. It's obvious. That's what we sell. Uh, in this report, for example, there's 1,675 clicks on wildflower seeds from Google. Those clicks cost Allen about $1,000 for $7,555 in sales. That's a good rate. 
And so that's an ad of a lad that's working. Allen says his sales have increased more than 30% since he started using AdWords. Wow, they think, wow, of course. Naughty and lovely. The folks at Daily Candy, an email newsletter, are also fans of Google advertising. The New York based newsletter, which also publishes editions for four other cities and a national version, targets young women who are born to shop. They are heavy spenders, uh, very social, uh, very interested in culture, fashion, trends, and as a result, uh, the advertisers are interested in getting their messages to these people. Daily Candy is free to subscribers. It makes its money by selling advertising to companies like American Express. The more subscribers, the more it can charge for its ads. And that's where Google comes in. Peter Scheinbaum, Daily Candy's COO, uses Google's pay-per-click advertising to attract subscribers. If a shopper types in sample sale, for example, up pops his ad. If people are looking on Google or trying to find information on sample sales there, they are great potential customers or subscribers. Daily Candy doesn't limit its advertising to Google search results. It also advertises on myriad websites that have partnered with Google in a program called AdSense. Website owners receive a fee for hosting the ads. In this case, Google searches for the words sample sale on participating websites and inserts Daily Candy's ad. It could be a website about sample sales or an article about sample sales, or an article about food or restaurants or fashion. Uh, and they're reading about the latest trends or styles that are going on in New York or Milan or, or, or Paris. AdSense has been a boon to website owners and advertisers alike. It's been hugely successful. I think it, at this point, accounts for a third of uh, Google's revenues. And it's actually a revolutionary product because what it has done is, is that it's enabled the millions of bloggers that uh, are out in cyberspace now to actually get paid for having a popular site. When Bryn and Page started Google, they had no idea how they would make money. Thanks to pay-per-click advertising, they no longer worry about that. Google turned its first profit in 2001, and it's been onwards and upwards ever since. The popularity of Google's pay-per-click advertising created a whole new set of challenges for Messrs. Brin and Page. Online businesses fighting for a spot among the top search results began looking for a competitive edge. The competition to be in the top five search results is, in, is intense. In fact, Google has created an entire industry of companies that do nothing but advise advertisers on how to come up with keywords that uh, will put them in the top five. One of those companies, they're called search engine optimizers, is prime visibility. This is showing us by clicking on the cash button what Google sees in its index. Andrew Hazen is the company's founder and CEO. Prime Visibility specializes in placing websites near the top of Google search results. To do that, they tailor client sites to score high in page rank, Google's measure of importance. Google is infamous for its uh, page rank, and they'll show you on a scale of 0 to 10 what the website's page rank is. A top secret formula, PageRank reportedly contains more than 500 million variables. In this PhD paper, Page and Bryn revealed that the most important variable is links from other websites. Search engine optimizers make sure their client sites have plenty of those. Optimizers have figured out numerous other PageRank variables as well. BoxesDelivered.com, one of Hazen's clients, appears among Google's top three listings. BoxesDelivered.com is a website that helps people on the move. Basically, when people are looking to move, whether it's commercial or residential, we know from our keyword research that moving boxes and moving supplies are the top two search for terms. Google awards high points to sites where the search term appears numerous times. So Hazen sprinkles the words moving boxes throughout the web page. 
And as you scroll down, you can see the words highlighted. And these are the words that Google can see in the formula and then take into account how often it's being uh, mentioned. But it's not just quantity that Google is looking for. It's also quality. Where do the search terms appear? Everything gets a point value. So a title tag, which is the name of the actual page, can get a scale of 1 to 10. It might be worth an 8 or a 9. The actual page content can be worth a 9. Just having regular text is not as advantageous as having text in bold or an actual clickable links. Hazen also increased the number of clickable links pointing at boxes delivered from other websites. The original boxes delivered site had only six or nine. Hazen increased the number to 90. So with boxesdelivered.com, we may look for a website, for example, that has a change of address service. And we would put up a link on the Boxes Delivered website first and then contact them and say to them in an email, we've already linked to you. You can see by clicking here. Please be good enough to link back to us. Prime Visibility's clients include Lauren Hutton's Good Stuff, Torno, and Wells Fargo Century. Website optimization is now an essential part of doing business on the Internet. It creates an ecology of competition that, that drives innovation. It also drives relevance in terms of, you know, the best sites that might possibly be the answer to a particular search are optimized to the top. But unscrupulous operators can also use it to drive their websites to the top. Some optimizers create hundreds or thousands of web addresses for the sole purpose of linking them to a particular site and improving its page rank. Page rank works on a voting factor, so they build their own artificial page rank, their own popularity by building all these fake domains. I know an optimization company that employs 50 translators that go out and translate pages just so that Google will index all these alternative translations. Some optimizers have gone so far as to set up special algorithm crack teams, reminiscent of U.S. and British World War II code breakers. And they study Google from the standpoint of programming. They will download page after page after page, search after search after search on Google to try and determine how, how Google is ranking pages. It's a constant battle that uh is a little bit like the old uh, Soviet US uh, arms race. Every time uh, one side gets a new technology, the other side tries to come up with a new counter technology. Efforts to beat Google's ranking system are a huge problem for Bryn and Page because they threaten what has set Google apart from all the other search engines the relevancy of its results. Google retaliates by periodically updating its secret algorithm. Back in February 2003, webmaster world.com began naming the updates just as the Weather Bureau does hurricanes. The first was Boston, followed by Cassandra, Dominic, and Esmeralda. Then, on the morning of November 14, 2003, came the mother of all updates, Florida. We really don't know exactly what it was all about, but we know it was the most intense update Google has ever had. Almost every website that was commercially based on the net had pages that were lost, that gained. It was a dramatic shift. Untold numbers of commercial sites that were ranked high in Google searches were all of a sudden blown away nowhere to be found. Prior to the Florida update, we pretty much knew what Google would do, and the updates were minor in nature. After the Florida update, nobody had really a clue what Google had done. It was, it was chaos for a little while. It was a major, major update, but it was an also, I think, a very important statement by Google that they're in charge here. <laughs> and at the end of the day, they can do what they want with their index. By the end of 2003, Google had signed up more than 100,000 advertisers and was processing about 200 million queries a day. It was the undisputed king of search, and many of its original investors were eager to cash in. It was time for Bryn and Page to take the company public.
2004 was a watershed year for Google, the year Bryn and Page took the company public. And the year that powerhouse Microsoft officially launched its own search engine. In their letter to prospective stockholders, Bryn and Page cautioned that Google would not be a conventional company. Their goal, they said, was to make Google an institution that makes the world a better place. The stock deal was a reflection of the idealism that they uh, bring to the way they run Google. And I think that uh, they set it up so that not just uh, institutional investors and Wall Street insiders would be able to benefit from the stock, but that uh, their entire user base would be able to uh, buy into the stock deal as well. The unusual approach meant smaller fees and smaller potential profits, thus alienating much of Wall Street. Wall Street was also concerned about Bryn and Page's management skills. As a result, Google's stock offering got off to a rocky start with a price much lower than expected. In the world of business, it probably doesn't make sense to piss off Wall Street in, uh, when you don't necessarily have to. But it was Bryn and Page who had the last laugh. The stock price eventually soared, and they are now worth about $4 billion each. Friends say the windfall hasn't changed them, that they still have the same values as when they started. I try to lead a modest lifestyle still. I have uh, my car is about 10 years old. It's, you know, it's Honda, nothing very fancy. And I have an apartment um, in Palo Alto. They are still very devoted to the business, very devoted to the technology side of it, to coming up with new ideas, building new things that make information more available. Nevertheless, the transition to a publicly held company has required some adjustments. So when their venture capitalists told them, Time to get a CEO, guys. You guys are growing, and you really need some adult, you know, supervision here. They didn't agree with that. It was really only until they could all settle on uh, Eric Schmidt, who was a very well-respected engineer with a lot of management experience and sort of a perfect fit. Would they even al allow the idea of a CEO to come into the equation? Now that Google is a multi-billion-dollar company, it faces challenges it never confronted before. The biggest problem, I think, for Google is how do they go from being a company that had 100 people two and a half, three years ago to a company that has 10,000 people in two to three years from now? That is the hardest thing for any company to do, and they're doing it at a, an incredibly accelerated pace. Many of Google's employees are now millionaires as a result of the stock sale. That creates other problems. I think as a result, Google and Larry and Sergey are going to have to deal with turnover at uh, Google in a way that uh, they've never had to deal with before. And then, of course, there's the competition. Page and Bryn have proven that search can be extremely profitable. Now, everyone is gunning for them. Yahoo has been buying up other search engines and adding services. With powerful Microsoft now flexing its muscles, many experts expect the beginning of an internet search war. We definitely have a new generation of competitors and uh, it's something that uh, uh, you know we take seriously. Microsoft and Yahoo are both very strong companies. To stay ahead of the competition, Google continues to add new sparkle to its growing list of services. Google Desktop searches a computer's hard drive, just as Google searches the internet. Google Print allows users to search current books for specific information. The purchase of Keyhole Corporation allows users, for a fee, to search satellite and aerial images of the Earth's surface. What Google wants to be, and I think Larry and Sergey would acknowledge that they're only a part of the way there, is to be the largest repository of information uh, in the world. With about 8 billion documents and images stored in their index, the web's preeminent librarians are well on their way. Anything that you don't uh, develop is a garden left untended, so to speak. So there are a lot of really interesting next generation things that we're working hard to make possible. Part of that hard work entails navigating through uncharted legal waters. Suits over AdWord clients using trademark search terms 
and the invasion of privacy issues are potential signs of rough waters ahead. Claims of copyright infringement pose another potential hazard. Google searches turn up large numbers of copyrighted images and copyrighted newspaper articles, for example. Google doesn't remove them unless someone complains. You know, if they can give proof of ownership of the web page, we take it off. We certainly respect that they're the owner of the content, and if they don't want to make it available, then, then that's, that's fine by us. Page and Brin's quest to make all the world's information readily accessible raises an important societal issue as well. The more people use Google, the more it defines who we are in other people's eyes. The danger is Google's information may be inaccurate or false. Google's search engine has no way of knowing. It just includes those things that the index picks up, and oftentimes those things are not the full picture of a person. Um, but people still make decisions based on what they see there. For better, and in some cases for worse, the genie of instant and ubiquitous information is out of the bottle. In centuries to come, historians may well look back on the world before Page and Brin began their quest and remember it as the Dark Ages. People will say, I can't believe people ever lived in a world where every single bit of human knowledge is instantaneously available for them. Such a concept is still a little foreign to our ears, but Google is making it seem a little bit more practical. In 2003, Google launched a new version of Google News for Canada. Google News Canada provides access to up-to-the-minute news headlines and photos from thousands of international sources and gives more prominence to stories and sources that are local to us. As for the future, Sergey says they're already experimenting with new ways to use Google. For example, you might be able to call a phone number, say what you want to search for, and it'll be pulled up. At this stage, it's just a toy, but he says it's helping them understand how to develop future products. Meanwhile, Larry and Sergey are finally spending some money. They purchased a luxury Boeing 767 airplane for the company. The two, who remain typically thrifty when it comes to spending on themselves, say that they have altruistic reasons for making the purchase. As Larry put it, part of the equation of this sort of machinery is to be able to take large numbers of people to places such as Africa. I think that can only be good for the world. The Google.org Foundation is currently doing philanthropic work in Africa. For the Biography Channel, I'm Darren Osborne. Right students, आज I hope कि जो आपने वीडियो देखी है Google Boys पे वो एंजॉय की होगी। इसमें आप लोगों ने देखा कि किस तरह उन लोगों ने एक बड़ा स्ट्रगलिंग टाइम गुजारते हुए एक विजन के साथ अपने काम को प्रस्तुत करने की कोशिश की है। और जो हम लोगों ने सीरियल एंटरप्रेन्योरशिप का कॉन्सेप्ट पढ़ा था कि जी एक काम कर लि� उसी पे नहीं टिके रहेगी चीजों को बेहतर बनाने की कोशिश बेहतर बनाने की जो जस्तुजू है वो सीरियल एंटरप्रेन्योर्स के अंदर हम लोग बात करते हैं तो इन्होंने गूगल की अम्ब्रेला के अंदर रहते हुए कई कई डिफरेंट किस्म की जो उनसे डाइमेंशन अपने बिजनेस के अंदर डेवलपमेंट डेवलप की हैं � Though they got a lot of money at the end of the day, लेकिन बुनियादी उनका जो मकसद था वो information की access हर बंदे के लिए आसान बनाना और उसको हर बंदे को empower करना था with the help of information. Students, आज के lecture में हम लोगों ने social enterprise पे focus किया. We identified the key attributes of social enterprise, characteristics क्या हैं उसके how they differ from their traditional businesses और उसके साथ साथ हम लोगों ने Google Boys के ऊपर एक वीडियो भी देखी जिससे I hope कि आपको उनके attributes को understand करने का मौका मिला होगा Thank you so very much Good day